function of first of S constitutes this time in a hybrid form at the premises of Mikey Katoyanis Foundation. Thank you all for your interest, support, and participation. And let me present you the coordinator of First of S, Mrs. Katerina Tsukunida, sitting by me and holding my hand in this <laughs> moderation if need be. First of S is an, is an Athens based initiative of Mikey Katoyanis Foundation, realized with the support of ESPA the National Strategic Reference Framework of the Region of Africa, a network of film festivals, film education organizations, and film conferences that right now. This year, we launched a new project, a di digital service addressing children who are into filmmaking. This service, will present audiovisual content made by children and will be organized an annual award, uh, will organize, excuse me, an annual award and a summer film youth school. In the run up to the implementation of this service, now three inquisitive webinars are organized starting today. Time to start. It is our, our pleasure to virtually have with us the regional governor of Attica, who supports this initiative through ESPA, Mr. George Patoulis. Friends and friends, I'm extremely happy that for the third time, the Idrima Michalis Kakogiannis, this big political guitar of Attica, is a important initiative, the national meeting, first of the first που στόχο έχει την εκπαίδευση των παιδιών και των νέων πάνω στο οπτικοακουστικό περιεχόμενο είτε από την πλευρά του θεατή είτε από την πλευρά του δημιουργού. Μια πρωτοβουλία που λαμβάνει η χώρα σε μια εποχή δύσκολη με πολλές ιδιαιτερότητες. Οι νέες τεχνολογίες έχουν κατακτήσει και έχουν καταστήσει εύκολη την παραγωγή και διάχυση οπτικοακουστικού περιεχομένου, χωρίς όμως αυτό να συνοδεύεται απαραίτητος και από ανάλογες ποιοτικέ προδιαγραφές. Και δυστυχώς, ο μεγάλος όγκος περιεχομένου συχνά μειώνει τη δυνατότητα εκπαίδευσης έξυπνων θεατών με ανεπτυγμένο κριτήριο επιλογής και αξιολόγησης. Αυτή ακριβώς είναι και η αποστολή αυτής της πρωτοβουλία, καθώς προσφέρει την ευκαιρία σε παιδιά και νέους να έρθουν σε επαφή με την εγχώρια και διεθνή κινηματογραφική πραγματικότητα, να γνωρίσουν τα μυστικά της, κινηματογραφική τέχνης δίπλα σε σημαντικούς δημιουργούς, με στόχο να βρουν τους δικούς τους τρόπους έκφρασης και να οδηγηθούν σε δημιουργικά μονοπάτια που θα διαμορφώσουν συντοποιημένου θεατές, αλλά και μελλοντικού δημιουργούς οι οποίοι θα τονώσουν την ελληνική παραγωγή. Σήμερα, περισσότερο από ποτέ, ο κινηματογράφος και γενικότερα ο οπτικοακουστικός χώρος έχει ανάγκη νέους ανθρώπους, με φρέσκια ματιά. Έχει ανάγκη από ανθρώπους που θα μπορέσουν να αποτυπώσουν στην κάμερα τη σύγχρονη πραγματικότητα και να προσφέρουν καινοτόμε θέασει και πρωτοποριακέ ιδέες μέσα από το έργο τους. Η Περιφέρεια Αττικής στηρίζει περήφανα αυτή την πρωτοβουλία στο πλαίσιο του Διεθνούς Δικτύου Νεανικών Κινηματογραφικών Φεστιβάλ. Μια δράση που χρηματοδοτείται από το ΠΕΠ Αττικής, από το ΕΣΠΑ της Περιφέρειας Αττικής δηλαδή, μέσω της πράξης για την καθιέρωση και προβολή διεθνών θεσμών σύγχρονου πολιτισμού στην Αττική μας. Η συμμετοχή μας είναι κάθε άλλο παρά συμβατική. Θα έλεγα ότι είναι ουσιαστική, καθώς μοιραζόμαστε κοινούς στόχους και αξίες. Για τη διοίκηση περιφέρειας, αλλά και για μένα προσωπικά, ο πολιτισμός δεν είναι μία πολυτέλεια, αλλά ένα απαραίτητο συστατικό του ευζήν, μια σημαντική επένδυση για την ανάδειξη της Αττικής 
ως Μητρόπολης του Πνεύματος και της Τέχνης, αλλά και ένας βασικός όρος για τη βελτίωση της καθημερινότητας όλων, ιδίω των παιδιών και των νέων. Thank you, Mr. Patoulis. And now it's time to welcome our host, the President and Managing Director of Michael Kakoyanis Foundation, Mrs. Ksenia Kaldara. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Καλωσορίζω. Θα βγάλω τη μάσκα. Ναι. Καλωσορίζω τους Ευρωπαίους συνεργάτες μας σε αυτή την κίνηση που θέτει ω στόχο τη δημιουργία ενός καναλιού επικοινωνίας μεταξύ των παιδιών όλου του κόσμου. Το Fest of Fests θα συνεχίσει να οργανώνει διεθνείς συναντήσεις με σκοπό την ανάπτυξη του δημιουργικού διαλόγου μεταξύ των παιδιών που πειραματίζονται στην παραγωγή της ψηφιακής εικόνας. Θα συνεχίσει να οργανώνει διεθνείς συναντήσεις μεταξύ των οργανισμών που δίνουν κατευθύνσεις για τη δημιουργική χρήση των μέσων παραγωγής. Σήμερα που ο ψηφιακός διάλογος προσφέρει τη δυνατότητα ταχείας επικοινωνίας, ας παρακολουθήσουμε τα παιδιά μας να κατακτούν τον κόσμο τους να δημιουργούν νέα προϊόντα επικοινωνίας και έκφρασης. Ο κόσμος τους έχει αλλάξει και εμείς οφείλουμε να στηρίξουμε αυτή την αλλαγή με σύγχρονους τρόπους. Είναι αποστολή του Ιδρύματός μας να στεγάζει σύγχρονες και καινοτόμες προσπάθειες προαγωγής του κοινωνικού διαλόγου. Σας ευχαριστώ θερμά. Senya, this is a perfect perspective for a bright future and thank you for sharing it here with us. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you again. again. And now, the educator and co-founder of Fest of Fest, Mrs. Athena Rikaki, worldwide known as the grandma. Here is the grandma. <laughs> No, I am very happy to meet you again, and I am even more happy because uh, um, I have to meet many new persons. Oh, all right. We are uh, in the moment to, um, to creating uh, one new channel of communication an international channel of communication. Okay, congratulations to all of us. <laughs> congratulations to you, Grandma, and thank you for everything you've done for this uh, institution. Thanks. The theme of this year's edition, inspired by Athena, by the Grandma, is the life and habits of Generation Z, how to effectively communicate with this group of people, Generation Z. The publicists, the professionals, the panelists are, have some, are with a significant contribution in content created, distributed and used for Generation Z. The attendees are also professionals coming from international children's film festivals, education and, and other institutions dealing with content for children. Our aim is to collect audiovisual content of maximum three minutes made by children aged 10 to 15 years old, expressing their view on their everyday life and ambitions. How this can be achieved will be discussed in the series of these webinars starting today. In order to do that, of course, we need the legal, the legal perspective of our legal advisor, Mr. Vasilis Karamitsanis. Please welcome him. Good 
Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Vasilis Karamitsanis. I'm attorney at law in Athens, specializing in the field of audiovisuals and cinema. It's very important uh, what you're doing here. Your initiative is really outstanding, and uh, I'm very happy to be part of we it. We are all doing it together. We have uh, tried from the beginning of, of, uh, of creating this pro project proposal to be in absolute, absolute alignment with the provisions, not only on a national, but also on a European level. We may say that working uh, uh, here, we can see a little bit the form, if it can get a bit clearer. So we have elaborated a number of legal documents, one of which you have all signed in order to be here present and is protecting what else but content and personal data for uh, broadcasting your image, your voice, your personality, and your name uh, on the World Wide Web. And this particular document that you're watching here, which is called Legal Consent Document, is a very critical uh, document, especially for protecting legal rights in the field of audiovisuals. Why is this so important? Because the most precious legal objects at the moment in, in transaction in the world, especially in the Western world, are data and personal data more precisely. Therefore, this kind of form is protecting that the organizers, the participants, the end users, and all the beneficiaries of the program are being protected according to the GDPR, which is the general framework, a directive issued back in 2016, and which is the strictest legislation worldwide for protecting personal data. Europe and Greece, more precisely, believes that personal data is an important resource that has to be uh, protected uh, at the maximum level. In addition, when we, we have to broadcast uh, creations of intellectual property, like films, uh, we have to stipulate the exact genre, the exact form, if it's narrative or narr non-narrative film, or if it's a web-based work, the producer and the creator all these are forming, by creating such a film or such an artwork, they're forming intellectual rights at every level and they have to be protected. Therefore, the organizers have uh, taken due diligence to acquire all the broadcasting rights um, by this form that you may see. As said, it's the director, the producer, the artwork, and some clauses dealing with data protection and uh, of course, uh, with transferring the intellectual rights for non-commercial, non-theatrical, online broadcasting. Great. That was valuable information to all our participants, end users, panelists, everyone participating in the webinars and willing to participate in our future project and uh, um, send us a three-minute video of life and habits of Generation Z. Thank you, Vasilis. Thank you so much. That was so, so useful. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, and now my turn. Well, this event starting today is an international one, as you all know. But I believe there is a uniqueness to it because of the beloved, sensitive and strong community it embraces. We sincerely hope to get some useful results for the present and hopefully for the future. Because Let there will always be communities with no schools at all. It was I went in search in the of the hole in the wall. When I, I was working with Athena's youngest daughter, the late but still unforgettable and full of energy and creativity, Lucia Rikaki. She was the founder of a film festival named the Cinema. In 2004, she had selected a film in the program of Eco Cinema called The Hole in the Wall, directed by Rory O'Connor and Jill Rossellini and produced by Italy and USA. What was the theme of this documentary? the revolution in information technology is redefining property. How much we know becomes as important as how much we own. The whole because there will world always be communities with no schools at all, I went in search of the hole in the wall. Rich, 
and I've always said uh, that it's not a question of what the internet will do to India, it's a question of what India will do to the internet. Children love a challenge. Learning how to operate the computer and learning how to use the internet is something that children can do anywhere. If you just pull a computer in public in an open space, then children in the age group of 6 to 12 will learn how to use it on their own. Irrespective of what language they speak in, how much schooling they've done, and almost anything that you can measure. The first uh, hole-in-the-wall computer was in New Delhi in 1999, and it was set up in a slum area. Within about three months, they learn almost everything there is, including you know downloading MP3s and graphic equalizers and uh, videos. I asked this child, what is this character? And he didn't know that it was called Mickey Mouse because he couldn't read. He said, it's a very nice game. It's a rat game. To him, Mickey Mouse was a, a friendly rat. India has always prized knowledge over many material things. All our entire philosophy is based on the fact that material things have lower value than knowledge. What kind of job do you want to do? So, computer engineer. An engineer? Computer engineer. Computer engineer. All three of you, huh? Yes. Oh, fantastic. We're moving from a world of have and have not to a world of no and no not. And that's going to be a very big difference in the way in which we deal with because there will always be communities with no schools at all, I went in search of the hole in the wall. I've always said uh, that it's not a question of what the internet will do to India, it's a question of what India will do to the internet. Children love a challenge. Learning how to operate the computer and learning how to use the internet is something that children can do anywhere. If you just put a computer in public in an open space, then children in the age group of 6 to 12 will learn how to use it on their own, irrespective of what language they speak in, how much schooling they have done, and almost anything that you can measure. The first uh, hole-in-the-wall computer was in New Delhi in 1999, and it was set up in a slum area. Within about three months, they learn almost everything there is, including you know downloading MP3s and graphic equalizers and uh, videos. I asked this child, what is this character? And he didn't know that it was called Mickey Mouse because he couldn't read. He said, it's a very nice game. It's a rat game. To him, Mickey Mouse was a, a friendly rat. India has always prized knowledge over many material things. All our entire philosophy is based on the fact that material things have lower value than knowledge. What kind of job do you want to do? So, a computer engineer. An, an engineer? Computer engineer. Computer engineer. Computer engineer. All three of you, huh? Yes. Oh, fantastic. We're moving from a world of have and have not to a world of no and no not. And that's going to be a very big difference in the way in which we deal with each other. Equalizing forces will have to change, hopefully from fighting to friendship. Thank you. Undoubtedly, these Indian poor kids belong to the Generation Z. But what is Generation Z? Officially, people born between 1997 and two, 2012. This generation tends to share some foundational characteristics related to the social, economic, and political present during to their formative uh, childhood years. They are characterized by us as our first digital natives because of their native use of technology, whereas millennials were considered digital pioneers who bore witness to the explosion of technology and social media, Gen Z was born into the world of peak technological innovation, where information was immediately accessible and social media were dominating and still are. Despite the demand for pretty pictures, Video has come to rule the social media landscape. As a result, the popularity of video 
is giving companies incentives to create more video content. Marketeers, influencers, news sites, anyone who wants to deliver a message to a next generation of consumers is going to have to invest in video content. In 2018, Pew study showed that 85 of teens use YouTube, and according to Google, which owns YouTube, they are using it to gain knowledge or learn any kind of skills, from cooking to makeup, how to pour, put correctly their eye line into their eyes. But Gen Z is connected, despite of what we think. Gen Z has the power of technology in their hands, which allows them to communicate faster, more often, and with many colleagues in one time. Generation Z is all about technology. From time of their birth, the internet and cell phones were commonplace, because being connected makes communication virtually limitless. It's very common for members of Gen Z to have friends from all over the world. However, members of, the, of this generation still prefer to have face-to-face -face human contact whenever possible, especially with people they know. The main difference between Gen Z and older generations is the reduced amount of eye contact employed. The younger generation was born with a device in their hands and are simply used to looking down. It's not meant to be a sign of disrespect or disinterest in the person speaking to them, although older generations may interpret the lack of eye contact as such. How however, this is not the truth. Change is very welcomed by Generation Z. With limitless information in their fingertips, Gen Z has a lot of knowledge and exposure to many different co topics. This is breadth of knowledge. They constantly seek new ideas and new experiences. Unlike previous generations, this youthful group is actively engaged in political conversations, despite many of them not yet being able to vote. Information is easier to find, making them experts in subjects very quickly. Now, diversity, which is a subject very uh, popular and trendy nowadays, but diversity doesn't even register with Generation Z. They've grown up in a diverse world, and that's all they know, neither race sexual orientation, no religion, are the identifying characteristics that they have been for previous generations. People are just people to Gen Z. It doesn't mean they won't judge, however. Gen Z is more likely to judge someone for what they are rather than who they are. Gen Z now prefers independence. A key differentiator between Gen Z and their millennial counterparts is Gen Z's preference to work independently. Millennials are all, are all about collaboration, but the competitive nature of Gen Z contributes to them wanting to control their own destiny and not rely on others for their own success. Gen Z wants at any case to be heard. Having access to such information, Gen Z has strong opinions and wants them to be heard. This is especially true in the workplace where they expect to be an equal contributor. Gen Z members believe their ideas are just as valuable as ideas from members of other generations. Gen Z now, this is a small surprise, can be a lot like their parents. No matter how much they try to fight it, Gen Z can be a lot like Gen X parents. Behaviorally, 
millennials tend to reflect many of the characteristics of their baby boomer parents, a key distinguish, distinguishing difference between the two groups. Based on Gen Z characteristics described here, we uh, drafted out the topics which we will be discussing over the three next days. Let me repeat them. One, Gen Z is the digital natives of our era. Is there space for children's audiovisual content creators to have an impact on the audiovisual content Gen Z selects to watch? Gen Z, video rules them all. How has that changed the contemporary audiovisual content production? Is there a norm or any other rule? Three, despite the demand for pretty pictures, video has come to rule the social media landscape. If you're interested in the aesthetics, you can watch with the volume off. If it's the content you care about, you can listen without watching. Also, if you're in a place that you don't want to distract your surroundings, you can select to watch with subtitles the image. So, is there or will there be a trend to pr produce and distribute audiovisual content without sound in the future? Which leads us to the next and last topic, white podcasts and TikTok are so popular in Gen Z. So that's all I had to say. And now it's time to welcome our first speaker in physical presence, Mrs. Kalliopi Haralambus from Greece, founder and director of Athens International Children's Film Festival. Please welcome her. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity, Lena. It's great to be here. Thank you for uh, the invitation to FESOFES and the uh, Michalis Kakogiannis Foundation. It's exciting to be here. It's exciting to know that everyone is watching. Um, Elena introduced me. Let me introduce myself once again. My name is Kaliopi uh, Haralambus. I, I believe that this is the fourth or fifth slide of my presentation. Uh, we're not there yet. <laughs> okay, this is the right one. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, uh, my name is Kaliopi Haralambus. I'm the founder of the Athens International Children's Film Festival. And um, the festival was founded in 2018, and its aim is to promote filmmaking from around the world to the children of, um, of Athens and to the children of Greece uh, for ages 0 to 18. Um, so we are very dedicated to our uh, families, um, the school community, uh, the educators, of course, um, and our audience. And um, I was very much intrigued by your um, invitation, and I started reflecting on the idea of the Gen Z. And I asked myself this simple question, um, how much do I know about uh, the Gen Z? apart from the fact that my son was born in 2011. So um, as I watch him grow and communicate with his peers, I acknowledge the fact that I don't know much and I'm learning a lot. But let me start and talk a little bit about the festival. As um, I think, yeah, we need one slide next, please. The next one, thank you very much. So as a film festival for children and youth, um, we do not create the content for, the, for, for, Gen, for Gen Z yet. But we curate the content for them, we design and package the content for them. And we aim to create an eye level communication. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned the fact that they don't communicate uh, they, they, they tend not to uh, create uh, an eye, uh, contact, contact. eye contact. But w we are aiming to create this eye contact. We are aiming to, um, That's to create. That's a challenge. It is a challenge. Not looking down to them. That's, that's the idea. That's our, our ambition. So we try to create an eye level communication, which is going to be built 
hopefully on mutual trust and understanding. And of course, support, but also positive representation, avoiding any uh, didactic approach, which is very common. When you're older, you're judging the generation uh, that comes after you're you. You're pointing your finger. <laughs> you're pointing fingers. So no judgment. Um, as a um, children's and youth film festival, we're also free from um, commercial um, restraints. So um, we don't have the, the restrictions that other media have. So for us, the material we receive is so raw and it's first hand. So most of the times the material we receive is the, the um, directorial first attempt, first directorial attempt of a filmmaker. That makes it that make, makes it very Another interesting. Another challenge. It is a challenge, but it is actually a genuine um, um, a, um, and straight reflection of this generation. So we come across this material, and we are very much interested into this. And I think that this material reflects the anxieties and the, the, the thoughts of this generation. Um, so we get the opportunity to promote audiovisual content that is as honest as it gets um, when it comes to this generation representation. So increasingly, and I'm going to get into my point, increasingly we have noticed that the trend of films, um, that there is a trend and the films are, be, are using and are inspired by the social media aesthetics. I'm sure everyone in, in the panel has, has mentioned that, has, has noticed that. We are the first ones to receive this material. We are the first ones who welcome this kind of material. And I think it is developing a new cinematic language. I will give you some ex examples in order to, uh, to make my point. So um, the rise of social media aesthetics, it is, is, this, is today's teenage trend, of course. It's about self-identity, it's about discovery, it's about a way to showcase your personality, your values, your artistic um, side, your artistic ideas. It is a way to connect with, with one's peers. So in this presentation, the slides that follow, I'm going to um, share with you films that we presented in our latest edition, just a, the third oh, one, the fourth one, just a few, yeah. just uh, five days ago. We just uh, finished our fourth ed edition. And I'm going to share films with you wh where this trend is prevailing. And I find it very interesting. And this, is, this was the year that we discovered that this trend was prevailing more often than other years. So we find it quite interesting. This is the first one you've been watching. You've been, I've been sharing this slide with you for a while. The film is called uh, Jawline. It's an American documentary about um, a young um, uh, boy from rural Tennessee who um, wants, who aspires to become the next big internet sen sensation. So you see that for example, in this, in this specific example, you see that um, uh, the theme of the film itself is the internet, is the social media. In the, in, the, in, the, in the examples that I'm going to share with you later, you will see that format, style, themes, even tools are directly associated with the social um, media. Um, let me share with you another example. So, yeah, this is again from the film, um, from, from Jawline. Uh, Girlhood, a Greek film produced in 2021. It's a documentary about three girls in, in quarantine during COVID-19. These three girls, they share everything and they, they make their um, pay, conversations and, and uh, an intimate sharing using Instagram, YouTube and TikTok videos. Um, but it's the storytelling, it's interweaved in the storytelling, and I find this fascinating that it's, it's coming. Another short film, Selfie, American short film, you see that, again, here you, you use, the, they, they use the social media image and the theme again, the tools, uh, the, the, the style and the theme, also inspired by social media. This is an interesting uh, Czech short film. I'm just, I'm not going to bore you with um, synopsis and, and ideas about, um, and themes of films, but again, look at this, hear this story. This is a story about two 10 year olds who um, take YouTube lessons at school 
and um, the teacher tells them that likes and popularity doesn't come without any cost. So they decide to stage um, school shooting in order to promote their YouTube uh, account. It raises questions. It's interesting. It's, it raises the questions. We're sharing this material with the young audience in order to, sh to ask the questions, not to, to tell them what they should be doing. It just raises the question. Again, he, this is another example of a film that uses the idea of the social media exposure um, and the, the idea of privacy and um, how honest you should be during your interaction. Um, um, again, I said the word should, you know, you see, it just, it just, <laughs> it always fails me. The idea of what is your private self and what is your public self, what is your social persona, what is your real self. It's always there, the question is always there. Uh, this, is an, uh, this is an interesting um, case, uh, Share uh, again, another US film, um, it's a documentary um, done in 2018. Here you see that the form is derived from the vertical phone frame. The whole film, um, it's the next slide. Here, here it is. So the whole film is done on a vertical phone frame, the whole thing. And of course, the theme and the, um, and the form, again, they're about social media, exposure, and the painful, um, um, the heartbreaking story of a Gen Z teenager who wants to come out and it's easier for them to come out on social media that, rather than um, come out to their family. Okay, um, another um, example here, you see form and content, everything is like inter in interconnected with this aesthetics. And another example here. So what I'm trying to say with all these examples about um, this new language, we are, we are monitoring it. We are trying to, understanding, to understand it. So how do we perceive our role in, in a contemporary society? We obviously are here to share, to offer this, those films a way to find their audience. This is, this is our job. This is what festivals do. But on the other hand, there is a paradox. I, I feel there is a paradox. Like quite often, we as festivals, we are still learning how to communicate with this generation. We are still learning how to reach uh, this audience and how to speak the, the language and how to engage with them. So curating films, curating the program that features films which speak this language, the one that I shared with you, seems to be one way to engage with them on their own terms. It's, it's, we're, we're experimenting with it. So um, I just want to share the last picture with you. Here's my son, born in 2011. Uh, last week, it's the previous slide, thank you. He was, he, he, he and his friends, they just came to watch films at the festival. And I just realized by watching them, these are the kids who are going to be making the films that we're going to watch in like five or 10 years. So this is their language. Even now. Even today, exactly, even today. So the, the question is, we need to be able to learn to speak their language. We need to be able to understand their language. We need to be able, for me, to ask the open-ending questions, not have the answer, no judgment, no judgment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kaliopi, for bringing so many challenges in uh, the tape. And um, what struck me is the word share. And I think that's the very essence of what we are doing and of what we ought to do as adults dealing with Gen Z. Thank you very much. Thank Have you. Have a great success in the future with your festival. And I hope you can share your views and everything you do. Thank you. And now uh, from... Athens, Greece, we are moving to virtually, we're moving virtually to Serbia and Belgrade to meet our dear friend Miumi Racevic, president of Media Education Center.
Niumir, are you here with us? Okay, let's then um, pass on to the next speaker, who is Dr. Constantina Hajara. Uh, Constantina is the scientific director of NEWS, which is the Institute of Digital Learning and Communication, and she's from Thessaloniki. Constantina, welcome. Uh, I can hear. Oh, now. You want me to, to talk because I saw yes, a message please. to unmute. Oh, okay. Because I saw a message to unmute. So uh, my name is Constantina Hazara. Uh, I am a founder of NUS, the Institute of Digital Learning and Communication. We... The reason I'm here is because uh, we have a very big educational program for films. Is it possible to view my um, PowerPoint as well as I talk? Uh, Lena, I cannot see my, my PowerPoint at all. Ah, I can say, I, okay, that's fine. So, hold on a minute. Yeah. I think it's okay now. Sorry for that. I thought uh, that you were going to. Show we apologize for that. No, that's fine. It's just going to take a minute. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's like the internet. Uh, fine. So you can view my PowerPoint now, yeah? Uh, yeah, yeah. Nessa saku ala tinakano. Padia tie gina me to PPT. Now? Uh, Constantina, can you show it? Yeah. Is it okay now? Yeah? Give us, okay, we have it. We have it. Okay. Okay, that's fine. It's okay. on screen. So I'll start again, yeah? Um, so anyway, in NUS, yeah, NUS is a, a non-profit organization and uh, uh, we have uh, schools that they come and visit us every day, uh, primary schools uh, mostly and special needs schools. Um, what they do is they make a film. They make, not a film really, they make a video as part of uh, their educational program. They use no technologies in order to do that. Um, so you can see some pictures of how we work. So it is not a typical educational uh, environment. So uh, children, uh, uh, they can just sit very uh, in a different places and they have tablets on their hands. So what they do is firstly, they make a story, I'll show you, after that. Uh, this is what I told you before. I mean, we do many things in news, but uh, the reason I'm here is because um, we do this, whole, this educational programs for schools. But uh, we do educational software as well, and we do research. Um, we chose films, we chose um, uh, this kind of project-based education because we think films is like a means of expression for young children. And uh, we decide to combine really all different media. It's not like a multimedia production, yeah? But it is kind of has like a picture, so um, children can draw. Uh, children make animations in computers. They make stories and uh, they record their voices, the stories they made. And uh, then we do a presentation so schools can see the work and then we put them on YouTube as well so schools can uh, view them later. 
um, we have made more than 1,000 short movies because we have at least two schools, each two two um, two classes, not schools, yeah, uh, classes. So we have uh, two different classes a day. So we have two different groups for 25 uh, people in each one, and uh, they do all the work in this one hour and a half. Um, so first, we just uh, show them a multimedia uh, film or two, for a, a very small one, yeah, like a th three minutes one, just to inspire them of what they'll do after. And um, so this is how we work with them for one hour and a half. They do no preparation before. Uh, they produce movies. All children are involved, so they are divided in three different groups. One group is writing the story. The other group is making the animations, and the other group is making is uh, uh, looking at augmented reality and uh, virtual reality stuff. So they are inspired to go on with the movie. And the, these three teams they move in a circle, so all children do everything. Uh, if they can learn through this, yes, we've done research that is published as well, so they can learn through um, film. Um, they can express themselves so we can see that in their faces when they see the movies, how excited they are. You know, all of us, we are hooked on the internet and in the, this is like the time of image. I mean, this area uh, for at least uh, uh, 35 years, yeah. And uh, I can see uh, image is gaining more and more and more in, um, in the world. This is how we work more or less, yeah? So the children, they make a story, uh, they, they write it down, uh, I mean, all together. So one person starts and the other person continues. And uh, then they gather and uh, they say, oh, this is gonna be the end. For example, this, this picture you see is one of our stories about uh, bullying, yeah? And so we, have th we tell them we have three children and these three children, they are very uh, aggressive and they all want to sit in the same uh, uh, desk. This is the best uh, desk in the classroom. So they start fighting and they start arguing. So we tell them, okay, but uh, you, now you finish the story. So, I mean, we want them to write the story to make a good ending, to see how the story will resolve. And then each child makes... Um, a different animated scene, yeah? So this is an animated, this is a scene they made. We use a program called Powtoon uh, uh, the last two years. We used other programs before, but now we, uh, we use a, a, a UK-based one, Powtoon. So each child, it makes an, an animated scene. Um, they make a storyboard before, yeah? So they draw pictures of how the film will be. Well, I mean, uh, we they do that again in a, a computer-based program. Uh, they do it, we have a big, great wall. Uh, so many children can draw at the same time when they imagine the story. Uh, as I said, they make different scenes and they animate them. Uh, we're talking about primary schools, yeah? So obviously the pictures are not very good. We are not aiming at having a very good result. We don't really care about the result, yeah? We want the children to communicate uh, in what they're doing and to uh, learn and to uh, pass a message, yeah? Uh, this is like the, pro this is how they work. Uh, so they work in two, two children in one computer when we have a class of 25. So they chose the things that the the assets that they will use in their animation. We record dialogues. So I mean, in the beginning, as I said, they write the story. So then we record the dialogues and um, with the voices. So they are like kind of actors in a way. And we use a uh, uh, music background. This is very important for us because um, this is, for example, an animate an animation they did for. Um, the planet that has many rubbish, yeah? So this is an environmental project. So different music will play in this and different music will play in this anime, in this film, which called we call it, it's uh, the lesson of happiness. 
So the children themselves, they talk about what is happiness, yeah? So we choose the background and then um, this is the end. I mean, then uh, uh, we do a montage. So, I mean, uh, we put all the bits and pieces together after the class leaves. And uh, then we put it on on the on the on YouTube on our channel. This is an unlisted channel because what we want is we don't want uh, to advertise these uh, videos, these uh, I mean uh, students' work. Yeah, we just want the schools to be able to see their work because uh, when they go back to school the next day, they all uh, um, uh, have a look at the film in the projector and they send um, um, a small paper to to the parents so they can view the film as well. Um, if we believe that it works, yes, we believe that uh, it works. We can see the children, we can see the teachers. We're doing that for the last nine years. And as I've said, we have uh, uh, at least um, 120 uh, different classes um, every year. And um, uh, we don't do, we are an NGO, yeah, we are a non-profit. So we don't have money for advertisement. Uh, we just send um, uh, what we do to schools. Uh, but I have to explain first that the first year we gave everything for free to schools. So the first they came and see this way of educational filming and how it can help them uh, learn. And uh, then uh, we are really excited that many, many school comes to us every year, nonstop. Uh, and they really enjoying what they do. We believe very much uh, in imagination. We do think that um, uh, imagination is like, um, you know, it's uh, the only thing that keeps children uh, alive in this uh, digital era. Um, I'm teaching in a university as well. So I can see, and I'm teaching digital imagery, I'm teaching uh, learning platforms. So I can see how um, young people are obsessed with uh, digital media. Uh, so it is a very good idea if we can use that digital media uh, to excite them, to uh, inspire them, to make them learn, to make them uh, see life in a different, for example, and I will finish that here, Elena, because I talk too much as usual. <laughs> but uh, um, it's very, uh, uh, how can I say that? Uh, when you see uh, these uh, children make a movie and talk, express themselves, for example, in this lesson of happiness, they say, we ask them, the film is like that, uh, what makes you happy? So the, answer, the children just answer to this question and they say things like, uh, uh, it makes me happy to be in the sofa with my parents and watch a children's movie. So these few things that we want to keep them alive and uh, uh, lead children to this way, to the way of creation and not the way of uh, passive uh, observers that they are when they're watching something. So we want the children to be creators, to be, um, uh, um, you know, to feel and to, to express the feelings. And uh, we are sure that uh, they can learn uh, through this. Uh, and Generation Z, of course, is the generation that uh, is like the most relevant uh, to, uh, to do this job for us and show to uh, the other people how this can be done. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Lena. Thank you, Constantina, for being an imagination intriguer to their children mm -hmm. and also to this webinar. And um, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. And now thank time you. to go a bit northern of Thessaloniki to Croatia, where we will meet Sancha Zanki. I hope I pronounce your name well who is an expert in film festivals, in event management, and marketing. Um, hi, hello, everybody. Um, it's Sanya. Hi, <laughs> I know Sanha. it's quite difficult to, uh, to pronounce, but yeah. Hello, hello, everybody. 
Uh, nice to see you uh, all, uh, even virtually like this, but hopefully we will have a chance uh, to make it uh, physical at one time. Uh, well, um, I would like to share my screen if it's possible. Um, I know that we are bumping you with all the <laughs> shares and everything, but just give me a second. It will help me. Okay. Um, can you see it? Wait, I'll go in presentation mode. Okay. Can you see it? Okay, great. Uh, I'll just be brief. Um, actually, my uh, my topic was about uh, it was about the first topic, but somehow it got to. Uh, um, to talking about children and young people um, actually who who must learn to actively use the media uh, to watch and analyze them critically uh, well um, this is something that we do in Croatian Film Association I am uh, actually head of festival and educational programs at Croatian Film Association and um, this is something what we do with uh, several of our programs we try to combine our um, educational and festival programs uh, so basically i will specifically talk about film education uh, program that has been uh, held for several years now over 10 already um, in physical form and since 2020 we have done it in in a digital form and there we use the films that were made by young people so um, by children and youth because we have two festivals actually uh, which uh, which are dedicated to uh, young filmmakers uh, where we show films that uh, they have done so basically uh, i can see suzanne here who has been uh, our uh, chaperone at four river film festival for quite a long time uh, with her students and um, several of you of course who who have uh, worked with uh, their students on uh, different films uh, through workshops to to throughout the year and then send them in the end um, to to our festivals and uh, so basically what we do and how we uh, how we get kids to think critically and analyze the films um, is through the film education program um, it is uh, done in uh, four periods every year for students and teachers and it's free of charge which is i think very important um, the most important things that we try to do uh, here except from film literacy and filmmaking are really the methodology of film teaching because we try to be open for teachers um, our premise is that um, you not only learn the kids but it's essential to learn the teachers because then you can get to more classrooms and to more kids that uh, maybe cannot attend uh, our programs uh, at Cinema Tushkanac, uh, at our cinema in Zagreb uh, from 2012 since today uh, we have uh, physical lectures for high school students and teachers. Uh, so here we show professional films, but then they analyze them and they critically think about them. So basically um, after seeing a movie, um, they have a long discussion with our educators and um, some of the kids, um, some of the participants um, after all after coming to to these uh, lectures uh, for quite a long time decided to start uh, to make their own films so i think that uh, it's quite um, quite a new um, perspective maybe for them um, that from one point we taught them how to think about the, the, the big films the professional films and then they started to uh, to make their own films and send them to to our festivals um, so this is a very good opportunity to track them uh, throughout the years and to see how have uh, they professionally developed um, in, in a way. Uh, since uh, some of them actually, uh, after uh, all of these programs, um, enrolled uh, to our Academy of um, Filmmaking and um, I think that and some of them already are finished with it and are professionally are professional filmmakers. 
besides the lectures for high school students and teachers, we also do film workshops for elementary school students. And there we actually somehow prepare them for, for the high school because um, it's done at the same time. So they meet the, the other ones in the cinema as well. And, um, and they talk about films up after the lessons. Um, the, the part that is done physically is during winter and spring breaks. And we have the, um, there more than 250 participants per um, each period. Um, proper sequel somehow was um, not only because of the pandemic, but also that um, we can uh, go to more, more, uh, more cities throughout the Croatia. Uh, was film education at Cinema Tushkanat, but the digital platform. Uh, you can see the link here. It was uh, designed for students and teachers, and it is built in Croatian and English. So if you need any of the films there, feel free to use them in the classrooms. Um, the films that, uh, that you can find there are films made by young people, so made by children and youth that have been um, awarded at our film festival. So at Four River Film Festival and uh, Youth uh, Film Festival as well as for, uh, at the Children Film Festival in Croatia. Um, they all have subtitles and um, besides the films, you have um, methodological uh, examples how to use them in the classroom. Our goal was to develop film literacy and encourage filmmaking because um, at, the end, each, um, at the end of each lesson, teachers try to encourage students to try to film uh, their movies as well, uh, and um, they really do that. Um, we um, we get a lot of films uh, that were made uh, by young people, not only to to uh, to Four River Film Festival, but also to the Children Youth uh, Children Film Festival. So it is um, it has been a spark uh, for them. Um, the film education uh, site is uh, for elementary and high school, and it shows short films. Um, so we have educational materials, as I have uh, mentioned, and additional texts for teachers. And we have quizzes for students. So in the end of each, um, each lesson, they tend to go through a quiz and, uh, and to repeat and actively uh, think about what they have seen. Um, uh, as I have mentioned, um, these films are made by children and youth, and um, we as, uh, as uh, the organizer of um, two big festivals in Croatia for um, children and for youth, but on, not only in Croatia, but uh, also for River Film Festival and Youth Film Festival are international ones, um, tend to um, give the, the mark to young filmmakers. So basically, at the end of uh, each screening, um, you can see the, uh, the photo from Four River Film Festival. And here we have one uh, from Children Youth, Children Film Festival. Uh, basically, after each screening, um, we have um, a Q&A with filmmakers. And there we try to give them the opportunity to uh, talk about their movies and um, just to to start thinking about how they managed to do something how it had been um, how um, it had been done but also to, um, what techniques did they use um, what kind of editing uh, etc some things that um, generation z is uh, not even thinking about when they are making the movies but it somehow comes very natural to them uh, but uh, when they have to reflect on it, um, it's quite um, quite a great moment when you have that aha effect. Oh, this is what I've done, and it's called like this. So um, for them, um, it's also very very uh, pleasant to see that um, they have some some things that they have done very naturally um, that uh, are also very um, film literature in a way. Um, through our programs, we try to develop film literacy by acquiring basic film knowledge and understanding the film language. And we really try to encourage them um, to make films, um, not only among children, but also among youth. And um, 
quite a lot of number of um, kids that have started um, applying films to Children Film Festival after finishing the primary school, um, do also films in their high school and send us to Four Rivers. And the uh, platform that uh, is uh, that is film education is um, is really a quite a good way to track them and to show uh, to others uh, what they have done. Uh, we are continuously working on new material, so if you are using it, always uh, try to uh, to refresh it and see what uh, what else has been added. And um, hopefully this year we will, after two long years, have um, physical uh, lectures also at, at Cinema Tushkanas. And um, this is how the platform uh, looks like. Uh, as I've mentioned, feel free to use it. And if you need any other information, uh, um, you can reach me and we can try to connect and uh, see what kind of programs we can work on together. Uh, thank you. I hope I haven't taken a lot of time. No, Sanya, not at all. Uh, it was um, quite a lot and interesting and diverse what you're doing there. And uh, please uh, share it with us if you can send us the PPT and we can distribute it to all the participants and attendees of this webinar. I think that would be very useful and also Thank you for uh, sharing your uh, viewpoint on uh, the collective experience of a film festival, which brings us back to what Kalliopi Haralambu said in uh, the very beginning of this uh, webinar, like uh, sharing uh, is the goal. And I hope we all share the same goal. Now, uh, let's move back to Greece to meet uh, Dr. Yanis Kopeteas, who is an associate professor in screenwriting and direction in digital audiovisual arts in the University of the Aegean. Welcome, Yanis, your turn. Hello, thank you. Uh, yes, I'm an associate professor in the University of the Aegean. Uh, my expertise is uh, in direction and screenwriting. And normally our uh, students are uh, above 18 years old. But uh, we have worked in the past uh, with uh, Afinari Kaki and also with Mion Dragovic. And uh, we have worked with students of uh, high edu higher education. And uh, uh, we got some good experience from this uh, uh, program. And uh, uh, also we had the opportunity to, to, to study the Generation Z. So uh, uh, as uh, the person in charge uh, who, uh, I'm, I'm associate professor in screenwriting, but also I'm the person in charge uh, of our MSc in documentary studies in Greece, the only MSc in documentary studies in Greece right now. So um, I may assure you that the main feature of the environment where the Generation Z lives in is the recorded reality as shown in the social media. The vast majority of the material or even raw footage uploaded every day on YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and all the other social media is recorded, is recorded actuality. Uh, it is not fictional characters, no fictional events, but actual events that happen in the same world as the world of this huge audience of this social media. As Lena Ramu said at the beginning, video rules them all, but it is not only this. Actually, actuality rules them all, at least so far. Probably in the future, animation and other techniques may rule them all, but so far, the recorded actuality rules them all, we think so. The Generation Z is accustomed to see themselves on the screen to the extent that they are not, if, to the extent that if they are not on the screen, on the post or on the photo or in the video, they may feel they do not exist. So the question is, what is recorded actuality? It is everything that can be recorded from a walk with our friends dancing alone in front of the camera, 
the unpacking of the precious technological accessory that we just bought in front of the camera, of course, or the recording of a class, a seminar, or a sports game. Actuality is the term for raw film footage of real-life events, places, and people presented on the screen with their real identities, as opposed to fictional films which use actual scripted stories and artificial settings. So, if we accept this fact, then this brings us to the famous definition of John Grilson's in 1933 that the documentary film concerns the creative treatment of actuality. I underline the word creative. In such a way, the documentary, the documentary film, which is actuality, has the ability of interpreting the past, analyzing the present or anticipating the future. It dwells on one subject by explaining it extensively, and this can be achieved by the filmmaker introducing some dramatic angles in the presentation. He can introduce conflict, problems, complications, crisis, climax, resolution. He can use his photography techniques, he can use editing techniques, he can use sound techniques as well. So actually he can do whatever he likes in order to visualize something and then narrate something or vice versa, narrate something and visualize this narration. The documentary deals with reality and not assumption. It achieves a closer relationship with reality than the fiction film and combine actuality with explanation, commentary and perhaps even dramatization. We may say that uh, if Generation X uh, main feature is that they live within recorded uh, actuality, then the documentary is an advanced form of films of actuality. And in fact, we may say that they define the limit of the norm the audiovisual film production of the Generation Z uh, has. So, uh, that's, that's the, the, <laughs> the answer to the question that uh, uh, Lena Ramo has put at the beginning. So, thank you. Um, uh, I would like to point out the fact, the, the word actuality uh, that you mentioned. Instead of video rules them all, actuality rules them all. But um, what kind of actuality is this? Is this a social media actuality? Depicting our everyday life and transmitting it over social media? Is it our social media persona or our true self? Is it uh, our private life, our private true life blending with our social media persona. Again, Calliope Haralambus brought that uh, issue up in the beginning. Um, most probably it's a blending uh, image of our actual self and our social media persona that we finally embrace and communicate to the rest of the world. Uh, but it was a nice point and food for thought, I would say. And with this thought, let's um, travel now to Central Europe, to Poland, and meet Jadwiga. I'm sorry if I don't pronounce again your name correctly. Mostovka, welcome. Hello, hello everybody. I hope that you can hear and see me all right. Greetings from Poland, greetings from Łódź. Uh, my name is Jadwiga and I represent okay. Centralny Gabinet Edukacji Filmowej. Uh, I know it's pronounced uh, difficultly, difficulty and yeah. uh, with difficulty and uh, there's no good translation into English. Um, well, uh, I'm supposed to talk about the Z generation, about the popularity of uh, podcasts and TikToks among the Z generation. And towards the end of my presentation, I would like, like, also like to say a few words about the Kids for Kids digital service, as we were asked also by Lena to reflect a little bit on uh, how it could possibly work. So let me share my screen with you, as I believe that um, some presentation, some 
visual aids would be uh, good. Okay, I, I hope you can see my presentation right now. And so that's that's the title. Yes, and, we can. Uh, what? Yes, uh, I believe it's in full screen mode right now. Again, all right, I'll try again. How about uh, now? Correct, right? yeah. Okay, yes. so, okay, all right, so let's move on. I hope you can now see it. All right, a lot has been said already about the Z generation, so I'm not going to go back to what already been said by previous speakers. Obviously, that's uh, the generation that most easily juggles various forms of uh, media, whether it be online or traditional, and uh, finding those that best suits their current, uh, current needs. And they are, of course, considered to be a generation that spends little time in the real world. I, I'm not sure if that's true, but that's, that's how they are. They, they've seen, they are seen especially by all the generations. And if you compare younger generation, generation Y and generation Z, you can obviously see that the attention span is dropping, that they use multiple screens at once to the more extent that uh, millennials, and they prefer social media that are focused on visual messages, um, short visual messages, and hence uh, the popularity of TikTok among the uh, generation Z. Mm. Uh, I know that there have been a lot of research on um, Generation Z uh, and po popularity of podcasts and TikToks among that gen generation, uh, but I would like to refer to a fairly recent Polish report because it might be interesting maybe to compare how it is in your own countries. Um, and so over 8 million Poles have had contact with this medium and the group of TikTok users increased by 80, by 58% compared to the previous year. I know it may be uh, the pandemic time, the COVID situation has also some impact on that, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a large number here really. And um, there are also older users uh, outside the so-called uh, Generation Z. I believe it is uh, very common with all the social media that younger people are starting using them and then all the generation are joining in. Uh, also, uh, if you see that 40% of Polish respondents use the application from one to five times a day, I believe it's also quite often, and uh, so-called heavy users seems to be still younger users, but older users are becoming more frequent also users of a, of a TikTok. And um, people use TikTok to a large extent even for over two hours a day. So it's a, it's a, it's a time-consuming hobby, obviously. And more than half of the respondents admitted that they record their own TikTok. Uh, so they not only consume the visuals uh, prepared by other users of TikTok, but they also create their own. And um, of course, it's probably no surprise for you that um, materials such as trend challenges, dancing, lip syncing, that, those are the most uh, popular uh, TikToks that are produced, that are presented, recorded by, by the users. I believe it's probably the same thing elsewhere. And we may, of course, wonder why uh, podcasts, why TikTok are so popular among that particular generation. And well, we can probably think about few answers. Uh, one of them being the fact that uh, short form content uh, simply better resonates with the, that generation and TikTok fits their lifestyle, their media habits. It also offers what they like uh, most, which is uh, user-generated content. Uh, uh, generation Z, they're, all, they're also multitaskers. Like I, I've said before, they use multiple screens and then watch and listen to many things at the same time. So it is important for them to have a quick and easy access to the content, ability to simultaneously consume many different materials, whether visual, whether audio or audiovisual. So they can use Instagram and uh, look at the pictures or stories on the Instagram and at the same time listen to the podcasts. 
or, or to the music or maybe watch a film while listening to the music, doing things at the same time and switching between the medias, between the contents. But another interesting thing is, I believe, uh, the question, how does this popularity of, for example, TikTok influence the audiovisual content and the way uh, of its consumption? Uh, and obviously, consumption of audiovisual content take place uh, more and more on mobile devices these days. Videos are shot on smartphones in this fortress rather than the landscape orientation. And that, of course, changes the visual paradigm and creates new visual aesthetic. And here are some examples, some recent examples of some uh, mainstream uh, movies uh, produced and, and distributed by one of the uh, streaming uh, platforms. Uh, those are, of course, addressed to the younger viewers. And uh, as you can see, this uh, portrait, not the landscape orientation, the presence of the visual um, sort of looks of the social media is, is, is pretty obvious. And of course, like I said, TikTok's users um, like TikTok because it offers user-generated content. And what is also popular in, on TikTok, it's aesthetics. TikTok users are sharing some inspirations for those looks through mood boards, to fashion and design suggestions. And this popularity of this uh, DIY do-it-yourself aesthetic is all highly stylized visual trends is also popular and is taking over pop culture. And here are also some examples, again, from this uh, teenage movies, how are they advertised, how the uh, room uh, of the main character looks like. It, it looks like all those uh, trending uh, aesthetics from TikTok, how, how the room of a, of a TikToker should look like, uh, the room of the main character in the movie looks uh, pretty much uh, the same. Mm. So like in the 80s and 90s, uh, MTV and music television and video clips were um, uh, taking over pop culture. Now it's, it's social, social media. Uh, but, you know, it's, I, I believe it is, it is worth to talk about, discuss the generation, uh, about um, to under, better understand logic and actions of, of, of the representatives. But um, whenever we talk about uh, generation, we... Um, must be careful because uh, it may lead us to some generalization, simpli simplification, stereotypes, uh, to in putting people in, in, in boxes. Especially when we focus on those negative qualities, we may not see people how they really are. We may not see their creative potential, uh, who they want to be, who uh, they could be. Um, and... Um, that was also men mentioned by Lena before that, especially older generation tend to criticize younger ones and, and see some negative qualities in them. And of course, this Kids for Kids uh, digital service, I believe um, can be an answer to that uh, because it, it can help um, young people to have uh, an opportunity to express their views. But let me play a devil's advocate for a moment. Uh, do they need kids for kids if they already have TikTok? And how can we make this service attractive place for children, a platform when they would like to be with their content? Uh, a platform cannot um, exist without the help of the adults, but we should probably think how uh, we could make it the place, the space of for the children, really kids for kids, really for kids, kids for kids. That's, that's the key issue here and i believe asking children how this platform should look like that would be a very important step because we adults are meeting we discussing it of course that's important but we should also uh, give opportunity to children to kids to have their say and possible solutions also in organizing the service would be uh, to give uh, young people a space where they could comment and they could be experts maybe on on uh, on the audiovisual content how to create them they could vote for the best videos. Um, they could comment whether this material is complete, whether those films represent their lives. Um, so uh, altogether, we should let them, them speak for themselves. And as for the sources, uh, as for the content, where we can get them, 
when you can get the content, where you can get the films from. The best source, of course, are open sections of film, uh, children films festivals, national, international. Uh, maybe it would be possible to create some new special Kids for Kids section at some festivals. Also organize new, new independent competitions. And third option is ask organizing film workshops, those who organize film workshops for children to, to provide some films, of course, a regulation in, about the licenses, legal, legal uh, issues should be, should be uh, 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 decided how it, how it should look like. We probably could discuss this. In case of the institutions, they would be responsible to, to uh, obtaining necessary consent. Well, um, but the most important thing from our perspective is to make it really kids for kids uh, service and let uh, young people to be seen, to uh, be uh, visible, to stay connected uh, with uh, what's important uh, for them. So I think that would be it for me. Um, thank you very much. And many thanks to my colleague Dorota, who's here with me too, for her, in her input into this presentation. And here are some contact details if you would like to uh, contact us uh, later, please do that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yati, Yatiga. This time I said it right, I, th I think. Um, perfect, Lena, perfect. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me bring out a point, bring up a point uh, that the aesthetics of TikTok are taking over pop culture and um, no doubt that social media are dominating pop culture. And maybe we should think to redefine what is the role or what will be the role of Kids for Kids versus TikTok and uh, what will be their differences, what will be the different roles of each one and why kids would be interested in uh, contributing to this Kids for Kids initiative. Again, food for thought and thank you so much for your very intriguing uh, presentation. And um, now uh, from Poland, from Central Europe, we remain to Central Europe and to the administrative capital of uh, uh, European Union, Belgium, even though our close friend Gert Hermans is also in Greece in Olympia International Film Festival for Children and Young People and he will be with us virtually from Greece, a Belgian guy. Welcome, welcome Gerd. Thank you and thank you for inviting me. Um, and yes, indeed, I'm currently residing on Greek ground as a guest of the Olympia Festival. Uh, so what you see behind me is um, the design of a Greek hotel room. Uh, but I do feel closely connected to Athens. Um, closely connected to Athens, where you are hosting the event today. Um, but with a delegation of several speakers here in Pyrgos, I think the festival is also well represented. Uh, first of all, I think I should explain to you why I should not be among today's speakers. Uh, because as the organizer of the first series of Kids for Kids festivals, organized more than 15 years ago, together with my dear friend and colleague, uh, Joanne Blouin, I think Kids for Kids cannot afford to dwell in nostalgia. Technology has changed and so have the young people and the way they make use of it. The relationship between young people and the way, um, and the, the young creatives and the moving image as such is no longer what it used to be 15 years ago. So I am no longer an expert, although I still treasure my memories to those wonderful editions uh, that we had and for which I owe lifelong respect to Akina Rikaki. And believe me, I have. Um, so I'll be happy to see new generations of experts taking care of this project. However, there are some things I have observed and that I want to share with you briefly today. Um, I don't believe young people are striving for excellence in their use of moving images. That is why I see the competitive role of Kids for Kids as a minor detail. 
why do young people create and share stories through moving images? The question was already brought up. Well, I can think of two reasons. Reason one would be to belong to a wider community. Um, if the competitive aspect is all about to transcend yourself, uh, then the community aspect is more about belonging to a bigger group with whom you can share passions and interests. And I think this is what young people are interested in. So I think for the new Kids for Kids editions, building a community should, should always be more important than winning the prize. Uh, reason number two would be finding your voice and claim your place. Now that everybody strives for representation, young people's films should be the ultimate way to represent yourself and to make yourself heard. Uh, don't demand representation from the society, but claim it yourself and make it happen with the tools that young people master uh, better than anyone else, being the visual media. Um, Filmmaking as a way to reach out to other youngsters around the globe could be the driving force, therefore, uh, behind the new Best of Fest editions. As I read, for instance, in reports by um, the Youth Cinema Network, like the, the bigger association that you're all, all familiar with, I suppose, uh, in those reports, I read that COVID has helped us a lot. Um, people uh, projects that were tried out and failed so many times before did now succeed. Well, in every possible speech that I've made over the last two years, I tried to um, not refer to the COVID situation. Well, you can call me a, a coward for that, but that's how I prefer to take a look at life, not on what is happening right now, uh, but what will happen on the longer term. But there was an effect. Um, and, and in the report, I read that due to the eagerness of young people to make new online content, uh, contacts, which we called already community building, projects that always failed now suddenly, well, fell at place and, and people were, uh, were ready and capable of making the, uh, establishing the connection. Um, also due to the technical steps that the world was forced to take during the pandemic years. The medium defines the message, so new technical standards, meanwhile, have been established as the new normal. However, um, even when reducing the competitive aspect of such an event, I find the feedback aspect still utterly important. How was my film evaluated? How can we do better? I I don't think the profile um, of the jury is the most important aspect. Um, in, in some of your writings, uh, I read that you would strive for 10 renewed professionals. Well, I'm not sure if feedback from Steven Spielberg is more valuable than feedback from a Belgian workshop leader or an Italian media education uh, educator, although it might be more prestigious. Uh, but the fact that young filmmakers receive feedback is a proof of being taken seriously, a proof that your work is worth being discussed. It's a sign of respect from and a part of our duty as organizers. So we should share those comments and ask our jury committee to formulate them in a respectful and constructive way, I think. But one particular thing that I've noticed recently on the international festival scene is that um, well, I, I come from a generation of big catalog festivals. The prestige of your festival was measure, measured by the size of your catalog, the amount of films uh, on your program. Nowadays, I see a very different tendency. Most new festivals uh, work from a clear social commitment. They start from a civil project with film as a tool to support or to achieve that goal. It's no longer the number of films that counts, it is the impact made by these films on your audience and on your local community. I've seen it with so many new festivals that are joining ECFA, which is the association that I represent here today. Last week I was in uh, Oslo, Norway, visiting the Ablu Festival. It's a festival that has three target groups, children living in poverty, uh, children from a migration minority background, and children with disabilities. We've seen it with the festival in Athens, represented here today by our dear colleague, Kaliope Karalambos. Uh, 
we have seen it with the Enesimo Festival from Italy, with the Playlist Boa Festival, and so on. Their first concern is to make film available to groups that don't feel like their voices are being heard. Do they have a big catalog with many films? Not at all. They're not fighting for big premieres like the old festivals used to do, but their impact on the local society is strong and profound, I think. I'm sure also kids, kids will find a way to fulfill that role. That's what I hope, not by including themes that only concern the teachers. And um, in that respect, I was, I was really charmed, for instance, by the, the example that um, Constantina Chatera gave us today with the question, what makes you happy? Um, I suppose that's a question that addresses the youngsters much more directly than um, how can we achieve world peace or how will we save the planet? Um, so I think this agenda should be, should be defined by the young people themselves. So um, be honest, uh, look at us today here. It's a bunch of old people deciding what should be cool or what should be sexy or what should be good for young people to do and to watch. I don't see how we can decide on that. I'm sure Kids for Kids can only become a success if soon the young generation will steal the chairs that we are today sitting on and sit around the table to decide. And I'm not sure how Kids for Kids will succeed to do that, but I'm sure they will one way or another. And I wish them the best of luck and success in this ambition. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gert. And... Uh, um... We've heard a differentiated viewpoint from Gert, a mature one, I would say. And, um, but I have a question for you, Gert. What about if Kids for Kids uh, was revamped in a way that it would include podcasts, TikToks, Kids for Kids is what they're doing right now. Anyway, Generation Z, produces audiovisual stuff for each other, for their own community. So Kids for Kids maybe can be included in this very notion of creating for this very community. Also, I liked very much the fact of, uh, that you, of, that, that you um, juxtapositioned uh, competition uh, individual competition with community belonging. That was a very interesting and thoughtful point. And of course, the fact that you brought up um, Calliope's viewpoint and Constantina's viewpoint on happiness, what makes you happy. Let's all think what can make things happy and maybe we need to make through, and that's why we are organizing these webinars in order to find what is more useful, more effective to be the content of Kids for Kids. Maybe TikToks and podcasts rather than films or documentaries or any other audiovisual material. I'll give you with uh, this thought and uh, we'll stay in Olympia Film Festival from where our other friend, Irini Andriopoulou, representative of the National um, uh, Center of Audiovisual Media and Communication, ECOME, uh, will join us. Irini is a media and film literacy researcher, policy analyst, practitioner, and advocate. Irini, welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be among this uh, group today, and uh, especially after uh, dear Gerd that uh, we have uh, worked closely uh, during the last team face-to-face meeting. So this is a fantastic moment, and the momentum couldn't be better because we're here in Olympia, in Vigos, for the Olympia Film Festival, uh, that is all about celebrating this content. Um, I'm Irene Zepulu, I'm Head of uh, Education at uh, ECOME, and I'm also Co-Secretary General of the uh, UNESCO Media and Information Literacy uh, Alliance. 
uh, also working closely with uh, ECFA as part of uh, the scientific committee. So I have many hats, but all these hats uh, have uh, uh, one thing in common. Um, the law for uh, media, the law for kids content uh, in terms of uh, either uh, media content production or uh, film education. So you mentioned about digital natives and uh, children today are indeed the digital native as uh, Prensky noted some many years ago. And they are the native speakers of today's generation and uh, all the other adults, uh, we are kind of uh, the emigrants in this uh, new uh, media land. Um, children, actually, they are, they are screen born. They are in front of a screen uh, since the time they were born. Uh, you have pictures and video of them taken from the hospital, from their parents, so they have their uh, digital um, digital uh, 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 signal. Uh, it's uh, set in a very uh, in their very early stage of life, uh, and then they grow up uh, and they are uh, and they are content creators um, themselves. So what we uh, adults have to realize, and as media professionals do. Uh, we have to take into account their habits, their preferences, their own experience. We have to look into the new social media platforms that they use, like Instagram and uh, TikTok. And uh, we have to, to, to make them realize themselves, too, that uh, every, every platform, every medium has its own meaning, its own operational structure, its own operational code, and they should know uh, how it uh, operates in order uh, to create uh, quality kids content because you have kids content available either made by kids or by adults but the quality is the, uh, the main challenge. Um, they say that content is the key and they are right but the medium through which content is transmitted on the other hand is a queen. I would say to, to paraphrase uh, uh, McLuhan. Uh, um, so content creation is part of uh, uh, the media literacy uh, school of thought that we pursue closely uh, here at the Fome, either for uh, adults or uh, minors. And uh, it includes uh, the ability to, to access the content, uh, the digital content, the ability to, to filter and analyze uh, uh, the messages and the operational structures of each medium. And the third strand is uh, to create produce user-generated content. This is, I think, the topic of our uh, discussion today. And if we want to offer quality content uh, for kids, uh, we have to create the need for it, for quality uh, content. Uh, as, as the Apple creator, I don't know if you remember Steve Jobs, that he said when launching his new media product, he said that some people uh, give the customers what they want. But not, but that's not my approach. Our job is to figure out what they're going to want in a few, uh, uh, in a few years from now, uh, before they do it. Uh, so he, he paraphrased uh, Henry Ford, uh, Henry Ford, you know, the the, the car uh, factory uh, um, um, businessman, and he said that uh, if I had asked customers what they wanted, they would have told me a fast and forth. So people don't know what they want until you show them. And so that's the challenge to cultivate uh, media leaders' skills from their very early stage of life with the aim to create this screen-wise viewer that we uh, suggested in uh, the past few best of best. This screen-wise viewer reflects on, on, uh, on, on his media identity, on, uh, he creates his own media identity, and uh, it is uh, a cognitive uh, development procedure for himself and uh, a social development tool as well. Um, so, um, let's. Um, you have another question about um, if there will be a trend to produce and distribute audiovisual content without sound. That was interesting and, and tricky because. Um, I would uh, try to reply to that from uh, a personal experience as a media and film student many years ago. We used to watch uh, the space oddity of uh, Cupid with the sound off, just the image and our own music preference behind. It was drama based at that time. So we had film, 
uh, screening with no sound and our own music behind it, creating our own uh, music uh, video clip at that time, uh, carrying our own, our own reading and our own uh, experience of it. Of course, we have been developed many times before, so we, we knew about uh, the story. But about nowadays, uh, we see new trends that keep rising every day, a new habitual. So um, we can add, we can only estimate how this will go in the future, but we can try, we can drive the scene. And while can inform or film under the original content, the content that is diverse, multimodal, interactive, uh, forms that may reinforce the cultural dialogue and the development of agile and uh, agile and sustainable societies. So kids content can be linked uh, also with typical education in terms of, uh, of uh, getting uh, children to familiarize with quality content from uh, the very step, the very first steps of education. And the uh, media producers and media professionals, professionals should contribute to that. They should work closely with uh, uh, typical education, with schools. And in this way, a new social commerce with children being the main actors in this uh, new ecosystem uh, might, um, might evolve, might appear. And uh, with the adults, they start to go with flow. Um, that would be my main, uh, uh, my main point of view. Um, certainly, the regulatory approach is, is very welcoming uh, the use of uh, more uh, kids' content. Uh, the EU, uh, the European Union's regulatory approach to the supervision of the self directive. And uh, the circumstances um, are very uh, positive uh, towards uh, creating kids' content. Of course, it's not, it's not something. It works, uh, it needs a lot of work for Greece, but internationally, uh, and uh, we can see also that through the work of ESPA, the ex, uh, ECMA, uh, there is uh, much content that is being produced towards that direction. Uh, I would suggest one challenge to explore also the potential of audiovisual and digital archives, uh, how they can intermingle with the uh, user generated media production, and uh, to work closely with the important. Festival. Uh, we know that uh, there is uh, their impact is uh, quite uh, uh, impressive um, uh, in this digital environment. So we have to raise interest and, and go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. And um, I will stick to what you said that children nowadays are almost born in front of a screen. But this is the unlimited possibilities generation, the generation X, uh, generation Z. They, children today can watch anything, everywhere, at any device. And that's why they are the unlimited possibilities generation. They can also create anything, anywhere, anytime, on any device. And maybe, to get back to what Gerd said before, maybe this is their version of community and not individuality. Maybe this is their version of belonging. And I'll leave you with this thought, and uh, we will now start moving and visit visiting North Europe starting from Denmark and Mrs. Suzanne Wood, a film studies consultant. Please welcome her. Hey, Suzanne. What is this? What are you showing us? You need to unmute Suzanne if you can hear us. Yeah, can you hear me now? Okay, yes. <laughs> I just wanted to show you the dinosaur. Okay. <laughs> um, that's a group I belong Pre -historical to. Prehistorical <laughs> times. 
yeah, and we are not quite extinct yet, though uh, <laughs> uh, things we, we maybe are. I think uh, we shouldn't come with the, up with the, the answers, but we can still put the questions. And I think uh, that we shouldn't have to make the con contents, but we can still make the framework. And I'll talk a little about um, the next film festival uh, that I'm affiliated to in, in a while. But I'd like to, to pose some questions to the project as such. And um, the first one is we are talking about Generation Set. And um, the, the young filmmakers, but... Um, we have to get the concept right, I think. That the, con the generation set and young filmmakers are not necessarily the same. You have to define young filmmakers because um, what, what are the filmmakers and what are their intentions? Mm -hmm. And uh, which one do we want to target? Because as I see it, um, the formal and the informal um, way you, you, you target the, the different groups because you can talk about um, producing in school, that's one aspect, producing uh, at the festivals, that's another aspect, and then um, producing at home, which is a third aspect, and we have to, to find out which one do we want to, or do you want to in this project, which group do you want to target? Uh, do you, what, what, uh, what are your aims? Sorry, just a second, because it's quite disturbing. Yeah, okay. Um, so which one do we want to, and what is the aim of the project? Uh, do we, want to, to change something, uh, what kind of contents do we want? So what is really the aim of the project? But I'll get back to that uh, after I've talked a little about the next film festival, uh, a festival that is created by Station Next. And uh, it has the purpose to target young filmmakers, but uh, in order to get a larger group uh, the, the initiatives are targeted towards schools so that the, it's in an educational environment and uh, the schools will get some materials uh, provided by Station Next or the Next Film Festival and they have film professionals coming to their schools. And I think um, if we get back to what Claire said, that um, the, the uh, interaction between older uh, filmmakers and young filmmakers is quite interesting because the young are interested in knowing about uh, films already made to improve their films to make a greater impact. So how do you, it's not, that's a difference, or oh, they want to make it better. It's not, um, if you're in the informal environment, it, they might want to create clickbaits like a sh stool shooting or something spectacular. But uh, if they are in, in an informal environment, they might want to make better films. So that will really catch the, the attention of uh, the spectators in quite another way. Well, anyway, the, the films are, the, the schools select a film that is sent to a, a regional festival and they choose a film to, that's sent to a national festival. And um, <clears throat> the national festival will choose films to send to international film festivals. And the, the point of this, I think, is that the, the group attending the festivals um, 
when they meet others who have actually made films together, they will that that will create the interest in the young people. So that's why they this making a, a community where they're actually physically there, that's very important. Uh, just a second. So uh, that's one way of attracting uh, the, the attention of uh, general uh, generation set. Um, another question I want to, to pose to the project is, uh, what is the, the, the theme? How, how do you create, create interest in the theme? Uh, what kind of, if you want to, to um, make a film about daily life, how do you avoid stereotypes? Um, how do you inspire? How do you provoke the young f filmmakers to go outside uh, their zone of comfort to make different uh, stuff from the, the things that they are work, watching on a daily basis. I think that work might be very inter interesting. And then I'm happy to know that the GDPR problems are solved because that was one of my questions, definitely. Um, and I have a question about the digital divide um there must be very different uh, motives from the kids all over the world because um in europe we might find i have found that that uh, when we have uh, made uh, competitions uh, inviting young filmmakers who are privately making films they don't care because they want to stay on their platforms. So how do we, uh, how do we get them to, to uh, get their interest, really? Um, another thing was that um, well, my thesis many years ago, I can, it, 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 uh, was that the new media is based on old media. And I think uh, Jed Riga um, was in this same area where, but where the different disciplines of old media, like image, sound, production design, and so on, it's still the same thing, but it's, they use it in a different way. And that might inspire the people who are going to, to uh, make courses uh, in films. Mm -hmm. Um, that to, to, to use these methods to, to take Pinterest uh, to, to, instead of mood boards, Pinterest are um, mood boards and so on. So um, that's, I think it's really worth looking into, to go into to, to, uh, and, and uh, select the different uh, topics of film. So image, how do the, the, the young people go about that? How can we, for instance, the background, if it's, it's uh, do, do we want them to, to, uh, show, uh, to shoot a film in the same format or do we want them to try something new? Do we, we want them to, to go out into the landscape? Do we want to, to open it up or should the, uh, What's the balance? Should they decide for, for themselves uh, what format they should use? Uh, sound, uh, how do we inspire them to make new sounds? Or should we say uh, we are only going to use them the way they make sound or whatever? I think that's, that's something that, that needs to be, be uh, discussed. So, um, just a second. Um, it's it's kind of difficult now because all the things that I wanted to point out, uh, it was such a different uh, hard act to follow because you have all been so very interesting and you have uh, already 
uh, touched on all the, my points. So uh, I just want to, to sum up uh, and say uh, it's, I'm looking forward to, to seeing this project, uh, how it's going to be worldwide and really to how it, the, the young kids can make new forms of films. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, I would like to comment on um, the other relevant issue that you considered important, and I also consider important. What is the main aim of this initiative? Why is it important to inspire young filmmakers to make films about their daily life? What will be the incentive for this? And what will be the incentive for the peers to watch the videos? And I think I do have a version of an answer, which is because simply this is what they do every, in their everyday lives via their social media accounts. They project their personas uh, publicly every day through social media and they all share it with their peers and that's why they will do it. Our responsibility, as you said in the very beginning of the, your speech, is that we cannot uh, make the content, but we can lead them and we can provide the framework. So maybe what is so amateur and personal and private and maybe a fake persona for social media can be transformed to something that someone else apart from their peers will have interest in watching. Um, but I think this is a bigger issue and I think this is a subject to discuss at the very end of this uh, webinar. And let's move now to Serbia, to Miomej Rasevic, who could not make it before because, because he had a very important personal obligation, but now he's here with us. So moving to Belgrade, Serbia, and Miomej Rasevic, president of media education space, as I said before. Hello, Miomir. Hello. Hello to everybody, and uh, I'm sorry that uh, I'm a uh, little bit uh, late, uh, but uh, it was something that I could not uh, escape uh, today. Uh, in any case, it was uh, successful. Uh, I would like to ask you to share my screen, if it is possible. Okay, I will try to make this uh, visible. Okay, it's uh, possible to see my screen. Okay. Uh, thanks again for uh, invitation. I think that uh, issue you uh, start today with uh, many my friends and colleagues, uh, it's uh, very important. Uh, I, am, uh, I am from uh, baby boomers uh, generation. And after that, I worked with the uh, X, Y, and now I'm still working with that generation. So I am grand grandfather now. It is uh, four generation uh, in my, my, my life uh, for different approach uh, to film, uh, film industry, TV, development of TV, uh, IT industry, computers, uh, development of digital literacy. And we are today at the, not at the beginning, at the explosion of uh, artificial uh, intelligence. And uh, of course, that uh, it is uh, many, many questions. We 
have to ask how to continue. Because uh, when we are talking about uh, Generation Z, they are digital natives. It means that they are born in digital environments. Generation Z selects to watch. It is my first question. So, to help to young people to continue to produce, uh, to continue to produce uh, films in a different environment, from school, like uh, Suzanne mentioned, uh, through different organizations uh, like Media Education Center is, uh, and uh, uh, in the festivals like uh, our colleagues uh, around the globe now produce something in uh, Pyrgos uh, during the uh, famous Camera Zizanio and Olympia Film Festival. It is one main question, how to motivate that generation to tell us what is what they are interested to create content of our audiovisual works to be watchable for them, to be uh, amused by them, to they start to share and to participate in uh, audiovisual society. Second question is that the uh, video rules them all. How has that changed the present audiovisual content production? Is there a new norm or any other rule? is something what uh, we call now for set generation it is new normal and uh, it is very important that we from uh, baby boomers gen generation and x and y generation understand set generation to be possible to collaborate and to help them to do something for future of film and for future of all of us generally. Okay, it is it is uh, some uh, question. I put uh, now it's uh, despite the demand for a pretty picture. Video has come to rule the social media landscape. It means that social media is part of film and video industry and that we have to understand and to collaborate and to use uh, social media if we like to include that generation in our future programs. If somebody is interested in the aesthetic, this person could watch the film uh, with the, the volume up. If some other is interested for the content, they could uh, switch off a uh, picture and listen all this sound. But in the, in the film industry, both is very important. I, I hear something and it is not me. Okay. So, we have to find what will be the trend to produce and distribute audiovisual content without sound to give possibility for linguistic and other minorities to understand visual message. It is my opinion. Okay, Generation Z was born after 1995, so the oldest uh, in uh, third generation has today 26 year. Uh, the core characteristic of generation set is uh, racial diversity. Diversity is their new normal. And it is something what we promote for years. Uh, we celebrate this year 20 years of Media Education Center and we promote diversity from the beginning of our work with children and young people. Another char characteristic of Generation Z is their native use of technology. They are digital pioneers. 
who bore witness to explosion of technology and social media. So for them, technique is not uh, important. I also remember that uh, before me, Suzanne Webb uh, told us uh, that uh, we, we, it is not important which technology we will use to produce film, because everything is based on the ancient film language. We just have to include said generation to use tools they like to use to produce their opinion about society, about community they are living, and to share this with us. It is sad characteristic of Generation Z, uh, which has been referred to by some as the lonest generation, as their endless hours spent online can foster feeling of isolation and depression. It is something also what we can do with film. We can in, in include them in filmmakers' society to express their feelings and maybe to use festival to not be any more loners, to find uh, their peers on the festival to talk about future projects and to help us to understand them. It is some uh, question I also like to ask all of you, how can films production help? I told some elements, but uh, we can discuss about this. How to direct them in the meaningful relationship with peers from different countries? Because diversity is their normal, uh, it is their new normal. It, it means it is for them not problem in diversity, it is problem how to create relationship in real space, we have two years uh, pandemic uh, Corona-19 and uh, almost stop uh, any movement of uh, young people. And it is also a problem. We have to use film to solve this problem. How to motivate that generation to use what they love, digital technology, to colorize and humanize the set future and what is our role? It is most important for today. What is our role in this process? I think that uh, uh, our Greek uh, friends and the uh, Fest of the Fest uh, start uh, uh, 2019 uh, a great uh, way to collect uh, as much as possible people working with the young people in film uh, and video and to, to trace something what uh, must be sustainable and must be helpful for everybody who like to set, to help to set uh, generation and not only to set generation. And uh, I think that, uh, that uh, we have uh, to support Fest of the, of the Fest and uh, I will do this for sure. Uh, this is, uh, this is end of uh, my presentation and thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Miomir, and thank you for sharing your views um, with us. Um, I would like to bring up a point that you brought up and uh, with which I personally disagree, if you permit me. Uh, you mentioned that uh, it is a sad characteristic for Generation Z that uh, uh, it, is, it has been characterized, I guess, by some research or statistics, the loneliest generation, maybe, and that um, they have feelings of isolation, depression, and they lack meaningful relationships. Um, I believe that the word meaningful um, is open to many interpretations. What is meaningful for, for me or for you or um, 
for Athena or anybody else or a member, even a member of Generation Z, is not meaningful to somebody else and vice versa. So, uh, in my viewpoint, I think they, um, even though being in front of their cell phone screens, they have found a way, they have created their own version of community and they share things because this word, the, the sharing word, uh, was mentioned um, until now many times in this webinar. And we should maybe think more about what sharing and humanization means. Because to our generation, uh, the baby boomers, being with someone in physical presence and discussing and sharing laughs and stories and stuff like that and drinking together and um, being an, at restaurants or um, having shots at a bar, that was meaningful sharing of collective life. But maybe that has changed for genders. And uh, we can maybe think about it. And, and again, this is a subject for discussion afterwards. And I would invite everyone participating in uh, this webinar to, to raise a point and, um, and think about it. <coughs> And after that, let's pass to a recorded message from our uh, friend here, Ioannis Poulos, um, uh, who is um, an expert in audiovisual education and cinema education. Unfortunately, he could not join us by Zoom or being here in a physical presence, so he sent us a recorded message. Please see it. Hello, my name is Yanis Poulios and I'm a teacher. I have a PhD in film education and I'm a member of the organizing committee of an international competition of short films created by schools. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation and all of you for your participation. In our competition, which has been held continuously for the last 12 years, we received more than 200 films each year and most of them are created by students from 12 to 18 years old. So let's take a look to the features of these films, of these movies, that teens are making. Teenage filmmakers deal with current affairs. They are sensitive receivers of what is happening in society. The majority of the films deal with the internet, the refugee problem, the financial crisis, the unattractive school, the problems of modern life, etc. Also, teenagers make mostly fiction films and less documentary and animation films. Another issue is how teenage filmmakers approach the process of making a film. They are usually in a hurry. They want to get a camera and start shooting. They omit the first phase of creation, that is, the understanding of the language of cinema. For this reason, they often create videos rather than movies. Because we know that cinema as an art is hidden in the editing, the rhythm, the music, the photography, the shadows, the colors, the types of frames, the angle, and the movement of the camera. Also, they react when teachers teach them the language and cinema codes and reject basic cinematic rules. I will give you an example of the 180 degree rule. The camera moves in one of the two semicircles defined by the line of action. In a workshop I organized, a teenage filmmaker systematically broke the rule. When I told him, he replied, why not? But only he took the that, I replied, and he spontaneously asked me, who is, he? who is Hitchcock? Here in Greece, when we teach poetry, we ask a question that destroys the lessons. What did the poet mean? So when teenagers are asked the same thing about the film, react. Because they understand that the issue is not what the director wanted to say, but why this film sends one message to me 
and another message to my classmate. Another issue is that students often disagree with their teachers during the making of the film. In Greece, I'm sure in other countries as well, many teachers are characterized by a moral panic about the role of the media. They believe that the media are responsible for the moral deprivation of the new generation, that young viewers are passive recipients, and these educators view film education as a pill to illness and a tool for liberation. The above perception underestimates the subjective dimension of watching a movie. This opinion hides that the real meanings are not in the media text, but in the social circumstances that created them. It also does not allow young viewers to construct a meta-language, a kind of critical discourse. This meta-language will allow them to describe and understand what is happening on the big screen. We teachers have to come to terms with the idea that young creators are native to the world of audiovisual creation, while we are immigrants. This is not necessarily a bad thing. This apparent conflict is an occasion for reflection and creation. These are the thoughts I wanted to share with you. I hope that my experience from the student film education will provoke a creative dialogue. I'm sorry I could not be with you and apologize for that. I wish more cinema in schools and more art in our lives. Bye bye. Dr. Pulios, and uh, thank you for the work you are doing with the schools. They are really very valuable. And um, again, we had a juxtaposition there. We heard from Dr. Pulios that kids are creating more fiction, warriors. From the previous speakers, we heard that children are depicting themselves and their social media personas and their uh, actuality, the way they perceive it, of course, uh, from Ioannis Kopeteas, from Kaliopi Haralampus, from Konstantina Hadzara, from Susanna Wad. Um, well, um, I think that uh, he also, he also said that um, each person seen a movie is perceiving it in a different way. It's getting a different message. Well, the answer to that, I think, is very simple. It's a matter of interpretation, because what we see is how we see it. And there is no such thing as an objective reality. It's how we, the way we interpret the reality that surrounds us. The way we interpret a film depicting that very reality. Again, a subject for discussion afterwards. And now we are going again to Olympia International Film Festival for children and young people. I think, guys, we are the only ones been here and not there. Half the Europe is there with, uh, with you but our hearts are there with you and we are virtually with you. And um, let me excuse first Maria Leonida, director of Carpos, who is a jury member on, uh, at Olympia Film Festival and they have a jury meeting this very hour, so that's why she cannot uh, uh, be with us, but the deputy artistic director of the festival, Mr. Pantelis Panteloglu, is with us. Welcome, Pandelis. How is the festival going? Everybody's asking. Uh, I think we're doing fine. We know, obviously, that it's a strange year. It's a very um, unique situation where we are uh, returning to the natural, uh, you know, the physical festival. Uh, obviously, there are uh, lots of uh, regulations that we have, to, we have to follow. It's not an easy uh, task, but uh, I think we are uh, managing uh, quite well uh, until now. It's the third day of the festival, uh, and I think it would be wiser to talk uh, about the, this festival in the end of the, <laughs> of the week. Uh, so, uh, Olympia Festival has been doing a, a 
something for a very long time. We are uh, run, now running our 24th edition of Olympia International Film Festival for children and young people, and also the 21st edition of uh, European Meeting uh, for Youth Audiovisual Creation, Camera Zanio. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have been doing is, uh, the, the festival has these main two pillars, and then there's a third pillar of uh, workshops uh, for children, uh, and also a whole, uh, series of seminars for uh, educators, for teachers, etc. Uh, we're also working a little bit on the production of uh, professional films for children uh, in Greece, but it's uh, not our subject today. Uh, first of all, I would like to invite you to... I, 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 didn't, I didn't hear the whole uh, meeting because uh, obviously the days are very busy now and uh, I was listening on and off. I've heard some uh, interesting uh, points by Gert, who is... Uh, few meters away, actually, and um, also from uh, Suzanne, our uh, good friend from uh, Denmark, a long uh, time collaborator of, uh, of the festival. Uh, but I haven't, uh, I unfortunately, haven't heard everything. Uh, I would like to invite you, first of all, to watch the films made by children that are a part of the Camera Zizanio uh, meeting this year. They are 214 films by 30, coming from 32 countries. They will be available starting sun, uh, Saturday uh, on our online platform, uh, on, online.olympiafestival.gr. Uh, I think this, ca this can give a good idea of what children are thinking and what children are doing uh, and uh, how they are doing it. It's uh, a good uh, first step to discuss the actual content of uh, uh, of children. Uh, we had over 2,000 submissions this uh, year. Only 214 films are uh, managed to be in the in the Camera Zanio selection. I would like to say some things about um, our uh, way of thinking, actually, which is that um, I've been thinking about it as I was listening to the end of the discussion a little bit before. Uh, I think that teacher, older people and teachers should be on the same bench with the children, with the students, the children. Uh, everybody's learning. Uh, it would be unfair for, to the children to say that we are the ones to, 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 to say what is right and what is wrong. Things are changing. Uh, obviously, uh, there is a, an adult understanding of things. Uh, there's an informed understanding of things. Uh, uh, both in uh, film education, uh, various film education organizations, and also uh, in the uh, universities. But uh, th this is a new situation that's uh, been emerging for quite some time now. It's not something that started yesterday. Uh, the platforms available today and the formats available today have been already developed by some uh, very big companies that are uh, uh, more or less running the game. And we are a little bit... Um, it's not exactly that we are late, but we are small uh, if we get to, to compare what we are with, with the big uh, players. And I'm um, uh, reflecting also on um, something that Mark Reed had said uh, in uh, the physical uh, Festo Fest uh, meeting in Athens uh, two years ago, three years ago. Uh, so we are, uh, the, the, the platforms uh, and everything have their own unlimited resources. They have plenty of money to do whatever they want while, while we're always on a tight budget. And uh, I think the, uh, a very reasonable thing to do uh, is to discuss with children not what they want, what they want to say, because it's their, their decision, should be their decision, uh, but um, how they can uh, say something. Uh, I totally agree with Suzanne, who, who said that uh, the production of uh, images is... Um, uh, based on uh, actually the same techniques, uh, what has changed is the tools, uh, the availability of, of, of tools, uh, the easiness. Uh, it's very easy, really it's very easy to do something that in the past it would be very difficult. Uh, you can uh, edit uh, video, you can record video with your uh, mobile phone. It's not uh, rocket science anymore. Uh, it's not a specialized uh, uh, work. It is a specialized work when you, when you want to create a, a, a work of art. Uh, because we know, starting from the beginning of the 20th century, that cinema has been a, an art and a craft at the same time. Uh, there are some techniques there. Uh, there is a, a, a very collective way of working, which is 
hierarchical, of course, but uh, you cannot uh, omit anyone from the whole uh, pyramid of, uh, of the film production. Uh, and um, what we uh, can do, I think, as uh, uh, I'm not a baby boomer, I'm a little bit younger, but uh, what, we, uh, what, uh, what we can do, I think, is to put our arguments on the table uh, when we're talking with uh, children who have their own arguments too. Uh, I'm not really very much into the idea of, uh, you know, naming generations. Uh, this is like a convention that might uh, help a bit to understand the ages uh, or the changes, but um, uh, when the, um, the definition of a, uh, of a whole, you know, uh, category of a whole taxonomy is not very clear, uh, it can also be superficial. Uh, and um, it will not help to have, um, I think, uh, uh, this kind of, uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure what uh, generation I belong with. Maybe maybe I'm X, I'm not sure about it. Uh, but uh, what makes, a, a, it makes it important, what is important for me is that I, I can really discuss with my good friend, uh, Nikos, who is seven and a half years old, and obviously he's, uh, and he's around here, uh, uh, who is, uh, uh, a Gen Z boy uh, that has made a film uh, that participated in uh, Camera Zanio this year. Uh, it, there is always a, a need to help uh, younger people to do things, uh, but there's always an, uh, a danger to, 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 to turn our subjectivities into objectivities or truths. Uh, and this is not, uh, I think, the way to go. This is uh, this includes a kind of uh, uh, a paternalism, let's say, that that comes from a, from a kind of world that is not the world that we are living in. Neomer said there a little bit earlier that it's about diversity. So diversity is also, also generational diversity. It's not about only cultures, cultural diversity. It's um, uh, we need to create a space where people will be uh, discussing uh, equally and not uh, discussing under uh, unequal uh, terms. Uh, obviously, some people know some more things and some other people might know other things that we don't know about. And uh, this is the, um, the specific uh, case where younger generations can um, uh, really uh, top us easily because their uh, access and their um, because they're natives and we're immigrants, as Hama said before, uh, and uh, they have uh, the, the ability to understand some things quite much better than us. This year we have a, a, we have a, a pitching lab here with uh, short films, Greek short films made for children with a, with a children audience, professional films uh, for children. One of the, of the proposals there, which have not been, been presented yet, um, that uh, has been uh, uh, submitted by a Gen Z young filmmaker, filmmaking team actually, uh, is, a, is a proposal that has to do not with the film exactly, but with a, with a story that would be uh, developed both as a film, uh, as, as a game, as an online world, as something uh, a little bit more um, different than we are thinking. Uh, in terms of classic uh, uh, films. It's uh, a good idea to listen to, to new ideas, uh, and it's a very good idea, idea also to keep in mind that uh, cinema, regardless of the many changes that have happened during the 20th century and the first uh, quarter, almost uh, fifth of the, of the 21st century, for in this 125 uh, years of uh, existence of uh, cinema, uh, it has managed to flow within the world in a very constructive way. And uh, we should never forget that the, the core of the um, uh, language that, has, that is being used now in all kinds of audiovisual uh, material that is uh, overwhelming, <laughs> it's true that it's overwhelming, it has actually been uh, born through cinema. As a festival, we're thinking that we can start with cinema. Children and younger people should watch uh, films. And then 
they should do what they want, but we can offer them some tools. Uh, so I think uh, when we're talking about how children are producing things, maybe we could answer, ask them. And this is why I started, and I'm gonna finish with the same thing, uh, my invitation to come over and watch the, the films of um, uh, this year's Camera Zanio on our platform. Uh, there, is, there are so, so many interesting ideas out there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pandelis, for this uh, insightful uh, uh, talk and uh, for the impressive numbers you gave us. Congratulations, 2,000 submissions, 214 films from Camera Zizanio, and um, one of the filmmakers, Nikos, you mentioned is um, seven and a half years old. Quite impressive. And hey, we have films made... even from uh, four-year-old children, actually. No way. <laughs> very, very interesting. We'll, be, we'll visit the platform and, and watch the films for sure. Um, another thing you mentioned is that it used to be um, very difficult to, to jump into filmmaking, but now with mobile phones and um, you don't count the footage, you don't have to to buy the negative, you don't have to develop it, you don't have to cut it, you don't have to do anything. You just go ahead and shoot whatever, whatever you like, and then you just delete it. It's easy and cheap nowadays. Um, and you brought up very, very interesting points. Um, and with these thoughts, I will uh, open the panel to, to the floor. And uh, my colleague here, Katerina, will uh, assist us um, with the moderation of the conversation. And please raise your hands and Katerina will make sure that you will be heard and answered to your questions. Thank you. Or you can send us uh, your messages at the On chat. chat. See? Okay, it seems that uh, every question. I think that Suzanne. Been... I think that Suzanne is. Uh... Okay, Suzanne. Yeah. Suzanne Wad uh, from Denmark. Yes, I think uh, it was very inspiring and interesting uh, to to listen to what Pantelis had to to say, and uh, I. Uh, agree on such <laughs> on most of, of it and I think it would be very interesting to make a contrastive analysis uh, of the different uh, subjects in filmmaking like um, if you have the um, if you take image and you say uh, old media image is like this and a new media what, what's the difference really? Because sometimes if you point out the difference, you can see what are the possibilities. And I think that uh, old, old filmmakers or traditional filmmakers, they can present a lot of, of the possibilities to young filmmakers. And they get us in, of course, get inspired. We see, we've seen that at Station Next lots of times that the, 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 the professional filmmakers are inspired by the young. So it's really, it goes both ways, but it would be such an interesting um, thing to have, a, uh, to, to uh, make, uh, see what are the differences? What are the differences in sound? for instance, uh, between traditional cinema and, and uh, the, the young media, for instance, that, that um, old media is, uh, old films are very much uh, dependent on the sound and young media is not and so on. So we see all the differences between the different topics or subjects in the film and see what are the possibilities. I, I think that would be extremely interesting if somebody would 
uh, try and make a contrastive step analyze it to, to find out what are the differences in reality. Thank you. I have a comment on that, if I may. Um, it, it, it's like what you said, just said, it's like a repetition of uh, history, of, of cinematic history. When back in 1927, we had um, the coming of the sound to the movies, uh, which were then characterized in a comic and uh, maybe arrogant way as talkies, um, the representatives of slapstick comedy like Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton uh, went out of the frame because they couldn't cope with the sound. Um, it was the silent era or meet out sound era. And uh, some of these filmmakers could not make it. Um, for instance, um, the, the, the latest film by Charlie Chaplin, Limelight, exemplifies this uh, situation. Whereas um, new habits and new norms and new um, laws started to dominate the film industry in 1927. Also, let's not forget that that was also the year that uh, the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences was founded in order to internally regulate the framework of making motion pictures. So maybe now we have a repetition of the history questioning the use of sound or not sound. And this is just, um, I hope, a trigger to, to, to someone else to answer uh, the question or comment on the subject. Uh, can I say something? Yes. Did it ever stop? Then it was the color, and then uh, it's uh, Almost same another. year, one year later, it's, the color it's, changed. I, I, I think all these kind of changes that came within, within the, the 20th century, uh, and I mean, it's, also, it's, a, it's a matter of how the distribution is uh, made. We have big changes uh, also in distribution in the latest years. We have the slashing of uh, 35 millimeter film. And then in the past, it was um, a, a eight millimeter, 9.5 millimeter film, 16 millimeter film, 35 millimeter film. We have changes uh, over and over because there's technology there. It started like that. It started with technology. It's a, I mean, cinema is a, is, a, is a form of art that is based on a, on a technology that's changing because we are, we're living in an industrial society. This is the, or is it a post-industrial society? It's also technological. Uh, so uh, it's not so, it's not a surprise, uh, and it's not we should not be taken by uh, surprise from this kind of changes. Uh, we're, we're trying to follow as we're trying to explain what's happening. The things that are happening are not planned by us as a, maybe educational or informal educational uh, uh, organizations. But there are things happening in the society based on yeah. the economy and uh, the the way that people understand the younger and older people understand the world. These things were uh, dis uh, discussed uh, intensively from the 1960s, at least, with uh, you know McLuhan is a, is a very good uh, uh, <laughs> starting point. Although my, maybe today it's a very different uh, discussion, obviously. Uh, but uh, this is a very, a very open discussion for the last, I don't know, 70 years. And it's going to keep on going. It's normal. So it's not, uh, for me, I mean, I'm not scared about, uh, about anything. I believe that we should be here with our eyes and uh, ears and the uh, nose is open so we can understand and smell the, di the differences. Uh, now cinemas are becoming 4D, for example, with the... Uh, and now we have to discuss, uh, could, could maybe uh, we have VR, can, can we uh, create uh, experiences that uh, include the rest of our senses? Are they related to cinema? 
Uh, it's a, it could be, it's an endless discussion, but it will not stop. This is normal. Yes, I, I agree, and, and uh, I, I know the research, at least in uh, USA, is going on uh, research in uh, how to to include all six or five senses to the cinema experience, smell, taste, everything in the cinema theater, because as as more as we progressing technologically. And um, because of our, as, as Pandelis said, cinema is an art and craft very closely related to the technological advancement and change. Uh, it's like they are married to each other and they go together, they experience their uh, life together and the time span they are going to live together and we need to adapt and we need to understand with all our senses, as Pandelis said, nose, ears, every sense we have and those changes and embrace them and help younger generations to realize their dreams. And as Suzanne said, uh, we are here to provide the framework they are now the content providers. Anybody else would like to add something? I'm just going to uh, read out loud a comment from Chiarda Torbin. Sorry about the name if I haven't pronounced it correct. It's from Fresh Film Fest in Ireland. As she says, this may have been said already, but we are working with young people to encourage them to be young programmers. I think that there is so much out there, it can be overwhelming. Learning to choose is a powerful thing. That's a nice comment. And um, does anyone has anything to add to that? So apparently not. Thank you very much all for your attention, participation and uh, support. Let's, um, let's sleep with these uh, thoughts tonight. It was a really inspiring uh, and interesting session. Um, I would like to keep the words share, happy, thoughtful, and I hope to see you all tomorrow, uh, Greek time, 9 uh, p.m., because it's for America, Canada, and Latin America, and continue with our second webinar. Thank you all so much for your participation and continue to do what you're doing. Bye-bye. Thank you, Lena.